Welcome to the Intentional Encourager podcast, where each episode brings you compelling conversations and stories designed to entertain, enlighten, and encourage. And now here's your host, Brian Sexton. And welcome into the Intentional Encourager podcast. I'm your host, Brian Sexton. Thank you for joining us again today. And there are people that you meet and you see their work on social media. You see what they're doing out there. This guy that I'm having on today, I saw a quote of his, and I'm going to get into that quote here in just a little bit. But he is a former heavyweight pro boxer, a competitive chess player, a full-time author. He writes about how to develop stoic street smarts and realize your potential. You can find him at edlatimore.com, L-A-T-M-O-R-E, but you can find him right here, right now on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Ed, what's good? Hey, what's going on, man? I'm having a good day. How are you? I am well, man. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a good while. So let's start here. When you talk about stoic street smarts, okay, I, I got to be honest. I grew up in a little town in Southern Ohio, <laughs> you know, uh, not a lot of people. It was it was a historically black town because they grew up where, I, where the town I grew up in was settled by former slaves. And so it was a different kind of place in a little different kind of town. But I don't know that I grew up with street smarts. Define what stoic street smarts is and how we can develop those within us. Because I, you know, I want to do that, man. I want to be more aware of what's going on around me and and how to develop those those gifts and, and abilities. So you have to first, you know, break down the the two words or the two phrases that are combined to come up with my, my tag, Stoic Street Smart. So first is Stoicism part, and that's effectively, I, I don't like to use the word non-reactive, but a lot of people see uh, Stoicism that way, a system of non-reactivity to our, 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 our system or our collection of methods to remain even nil. That's what I like to use instead of non-reactive, to keep your emotions even nil and in control in the turbulence of the world, okay? <clears throat> so if we, you, you start there and go, all right, we have this system to stay emotionally controlled and even new in the turbulence of the world. Uh, that's important because the world, one, is going to be turbulent, unexpected, and if you are constantly in a state of reaction, you can never be proactive. You can never get ahead. You'll always be at the mercy of the things around you. If for any other reason, then you're always going to be uh, basing your moves on what the world does and not what you're trying to accomplish. So we have that, the stoicism part. And now we go with street smarts. And when people think about street smarts, it's not this idea of like being a, a fancy hustler on, on the, the, the or, or, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess hustler to be as, as inclusive as possible. It's not, it's not this idea of being like a street hustler trying to, you know, you know when someone's trying to get over you. Uh, certainly that's part of it. That's a thing you'll be able to, to do. But it's, it's more about being able to understand the human in front of you and know what human uh, motivations are. And people are, I like to use the, the phrase, rationally irrational or rationally predictable. Either one is fine. But either way, the idea is that how we think a person should behave is not how they will behave. But that's only because we're looking at it with the wrong frame of mind. We're looking at a person as like a, a highly logical machine. And the reality is most people aren't that logical. We think we are, but we're not. Instead, when people will are like overwhelmingly, you can rely on this. The people are going to default to incentives and how those incentives match up to their base level of comfort. You know, like, like a person is, is going to take an advantage or, or take an opportunity to make a lot of money. But if you offer them something that's going to relieve their condition of starvation and they're starved right now, they're probably going to be like, ah, oh, I need to eat right now. But it Yeah, it's like base. the fight or flight mechanism with, right. within us. And so, yeah, I, I love that. And I mean to jump in there, Ed, but, man, I love what you're talking about. About And I wrote this down. I was taking notes as you were talking. Understanding the human in front of you. Right. And I love that because I think people get caught up, Ed. I think people get caught up at times 
in just looking at what they want to get out of the interaction, right? They, th this is my goal. When I'm interacting with Ed, this is what I want to get out of it. Instead of stepping back and going, okay, what, what is Ed all about? What, what, what is, what, what am I, am I, and I talk a lot and write a lot about connection. And I think what you just said there is so important is that a lot of times we have our own agendas in the way of understanding people that are in front of us. Mm -hmm. What's a tip that you, that you have that helps you break down that, that getting yourself out of the way and really focusing in on understanding the human in front of you? Well, you, you have to remember this, and this is hard for people that I'm about to say, but you have to remember that we all want the same thing. And that sounds really simple, but it's very, but, but it's the truth. We all want the same thing. And we're not talking about, you know, like, like let's pretend like you want to be a pro athlete. I want to be a writer or something like that, right? Those, those not the real thing we want. We want what we perceive the value or the benefit is. You know, like they talk about in marketing, they go, you know, you don't focus on, on features, you focus on benefits, right? right? It's not that you want to be featured as a pro athlete or, or a writer. You want the benefit of, of time freedom, of recognition and respect, of, of making enough money to, to feed yourself and then some, right, to have good experiences. So we all want the same things. All right, so when you when you start there, then you go to okay. So how do we go about doing them? And you will notice that every single motivation, whether it looks good or bad to you or not, is all based around trying to achieve that. Now we can go about it misguided, of course, and that's how we end up with a lot of problems and misunderstandings and conflicts in our life. But the reality is that everybody's trying to make themselves feel better, trying to make life good. Even when a person acts unselfishly, they're doing it because they believe that that is the, the right thing that makes them feel good. So when you put those two things together, you can then look at everyone's actions and, and they, they look different to you at that point. You don't, you don't see someone trying to hurt you so much as you see someone trying to make themselves feel better. And very often you happen to be collateral damage. No, I love what you said there. And, and I love the pro athlete comparison. I'm a sports guy. And, and it always intrigues me that, you know, and, and you live in the Pittsburgh area. I, I live in West Virginia, but I'm a, I'm a Cincinnati Reds and Cincinnati Bengals fan. Oh, it man. always intrigues me how people will, will just, you know, they'll hop on sports talk radio or they'll hop on social media when Ben Roethlisberger or Joe Burrow have a bad game or, man, I can't believe that dude dropped three you know I can't believe Juju dropped two passes man they were right in his hand I can't believe that that he didn't perform and, and and we don't keep in mind the pressure that those guys have and how quickly things happen in the moment I mean I, I was watching a guy the other day do a YouTube video and he was a former professional baseball player and he said you literally at the major league level you have about 350 milliseconds by the time that pitcher releases the ball out of his hand from 60 feet, six inches away to decide whether you're going to take that pitch or swing. Roethlisberger has about a second and a half in the pocket to find a guy, if that, yeah, if that, to try to find an open guy 40, 30, you know, and it, and it could be a simple, you know, 10-yard button hook. Maybe maybe Chase Claypool is is running an, an, a slant over the middle. And he literally has to decide, I've got to throw the ball right now. I've got to release it right now. We talk about quick release and things like yep. that. And people don't understand the timing that goes into that. Why do you think that we are all the time so critical of other people that do things that we, because I couldn't do that. I couldn't stand back there and decide where do I have, not that quickly, right? Because I'm, I'm not a pro athlete. I, I, I've never functioned at that level. Why do you think, Ed, we're so critical of people that perform at a high level and say, you should be perfect? Why, why is that? I think there's a lot of answers. I'll just, you know, focus on the ones that I, 
I think yeah, because you're a pro- oh, former man. professional athlete, so you yeah, you're a and great then even guy now, I mean, yeah. Um, so a, a lot of people, the only access they have to the conversation to be part of it is criticism. They don't know anything else, and it's up to the person at a, at an, an interpersonal level. It's up to you to decide how to deal with that. But a lot of times, you know, they're never going to create or do something great. But we have to feel relevant. We have to feel included in the conversation. So what we do instead is we we critique. And critiquing, being in critical, that's an either it's a slow hanging fruit. It's an easy path to be part of the conversation, right? Because because how do you how do you identify with with something bigger than yourself? You either critique it or you become part of it. And when you don't have anything in your life to be part of, anything in your life to, to gain meaning from, you're going to choose one of those paths. And if you understand that, you understand a lot of what you see today in every arena, from culture to politics to sports. People need to attack or they need to align. And and most humans, I won't even say most humans, all humans uh, pick one of those two choices or they pick a third when their life is together, which is it's irrelevant. Like, like I have no dog in the fight. When it comes to to hockey, I, I mean, I, I just don't know the sport. I never watched the same. I watched neither, one man. game when someone like t- or two, I guess at this point, both times they were live because you know somehow I got tickets and and I went along and I didn't know what I was watching, but I was able to like okay step back and be detached and take it in because I've got no emotional investment because it's not part of my worldview. But once I make something part of my worldview, I I have to almost by definition take a side. Right. And then whatever side I take is is going to be emotionally charged if I let it be emotionally charged. Like like my big thing is whenever I talk sports with someone, my, my litmus test to determine whether the conversation is worth continuing having is whether they use stats to make their argument. If they don't use stats to make their argument, I know that we are getting into tribalism. We're not we're like we're not talking about uh, the sport anymore. We're talking about my my God versus your God, and I think and, and I'm able to do that because because I'm I'm gonna go at least at the point where I was really really watching a lot of football. I can do that because I'm gonna leave and go go you know kill myself in the gym for four hours. Tonight, right, right. Uh, because I've got a thing, and and if not that, I'm working on my writing because I've got all the stuff to worry about to get emotionally well, You and invested. I had nothing yeah. invested in the outcome of that game. All we were sitting there doing is watching, and and man, I had to. I wanted to jump in there because I had to tell, I had to train my brain several years ago because I used to get so emotionally invested that if my team lost, I'd be in a bad mood. And I'm, and one day I kind of had an epiphany, like I didn't suit up. I didn't participate in that. Why am I bummed out about the outcome? You know, it's just, right. you know, why am I bummed out about it? Because tomorrow morning, I might have to get up and go to work. I mean, what's it to me, you know? And it changed the way I watch sports. It's not that you don't get invested and it's not that you don't – you know, you were talking about a a couple of minutes ago, and I love what you said about the litmus test that you have for conversation. And the whole running thing has been Jordan versus LeBron, Jordan versus LeBron, Jordan versus – and and, and I I told my 20-year-old son this, Ed, and I loved what you said there. I said, man, I can come up with a stat any stat that I want to come up with to make my argument. If I can find it, I can, I can apply it and make my argument. Because he would ask me, he said, who do you, who you think's better, Jordan or LeBron? I said, man, basketball hasn't seen anybody like LeBron at his size, his speed, his skill level. I said, but man, you're asking me, Jordan was my guy growing up. I mean, and right. it, yeah, and then I watched The Last Dance, and I'm like, man, I forgot how great Michael was. And and but but again, I love that. I love what you said there about tribalism versus having conversation that's rooted in facts and and rooted in the the conversation being constructive and not destructive. How do we take conversations, Ed, and, and start applying the constructive part to conversations rather than the destructive part to conversations? Well, it all starts with your intention for having a conversation, okay? So I, I tell people this all the time on social media. One of the reasons why I don't tend to get into 
uh, foolish arguments with people, even when they say very silly things, is my my intention for being in social media isn't isn't to um uh, like boost my ego. It isn't to prove my stance is right. It's not to raise my 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 goal is first and foremost uh spread a message that people can use constructively earn money while doing it and learn and all three of those <laughs> arguing is at best uh slightly distracting and at worst outright costly right so i have an intention and i'm not saying all of your conversations have to be oh man if i can't get this bag from this guy i'm not interested no 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 you you have to look at every everything you do through the lens of how is this making my life better or worse? And once you once you start applying that filter, then you can figure out what makes your life better or worse. Because yeah. because I don't think a lot of people know. I just think they, they they it's a process of elimination and experience. You go okay, this argument really made me feel like trash. I don't want to have that. So you stop. You, you slowly but surely start to. Um, remove arguments from your life and you start to focus on connection and learning and, and having a certain approach to these things. That's how I think people get there. I think people get there by having having a real intention on improving their life. When you have a real intention to improve your life, it a lot of you, you just look at stuff differently uh, and and conversation is one of those. Every conversation becomes a way to learn, a way to make someone feel good, a way to make a way, a way to get something out of it, not to not to boost your position, not to attack another person, not to to complain or idly gossip. You really try to do something useful. Man, I love this. I love this conversation. It's so deep and powerful, and and I'm I'm loving it. Let's step aside, take a quick break, and we come back. I want to talk to you about the quote that connected you and I, and the okay. reason that I had you on <laughs> the Intentional Encourager podcast. My guest, Ed Lattimore, joining me today on the Intentional Encourager podcast back in just a moment. Hey, everybody. Brian Sexton here. I want to tell you about our sponsor, SEO National. SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. Now, what's that, you might say? Well, Search Engine Optimization helps you show up higher on search engines in front of paying customers for words that you as a business owner can monetize. What a great concept. SEO National is owned by my good buddy, Damon Burton, who's been a guest here on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Not only has Damon and his team worked with businesses of all sizes, from e-commerce startups to NBA teams and Shark Tank featured businesses, but more importantly, Damon and his team are about transparency, trust, and providing lifetime value. So much so that he still has his first customers after opening SEO National 14 years ago. Let me give you some intentional encouragement and call Damon and his team today at 855-736-6285 or go to www.seonational.com and get a free quote. Ed, I want to go here for just a second. You had a quote that I love that you shared on Twitter. And I saw this and I said, man, I've got to reach out to you and have you on the, on the podcast. Here's the quote. Crackheads hustle four straight days to get a rock. No sleep and no food. You ever work that hard for something? Don't get outworked by a crackhead. Take <laughs> me through the premise of how... That how you had that, that is brilliant, by the way. That is absolutely brilliant. I agree with it wholeheartedly. I told you that over social media. I'm telling you that here. That is brilliant because it's 100% correct. Take me through how you found that quote or how that epiphany came to you to, to, to share that. Oh, for first, you know, a lot of that is this just my sense of humor and, and what I grew up around and me trying to make, make light of it. Because, you know, you can either, what's the old quote, you can either laugh a little or cry a lot. And I chose to, to laugh a little uh, about, about my surroundings and try to come up with, with jokes to deal with it. So uh, one day, though, when I was younger, we, we watched this this crackhead try to, 
I mean, we, we just seen him around a lot. And for whatever reason, my mom remarked, you know, I had seen this guy up for like four days straight. And that always stuck with me. I was like 12 or 13. And one day I just, you know, I'm piecing together things and words and I'm, I'm coming up with analogies to make a point and have some fun. And that's where that, that comes from. It's just me me having a sense of humor. But in that joke, like all good jokes, there is uh, truth. And in that truth, it, you know, but if you're focused on the crack part, you miss the point. Like completely miss the point. And some 100%. people do. And they, they get the, you know, I've had people write me, be like, you know, I know someone that died of an overdose. And I'm like, you're not, like, you're missing the point. I'm sorry that, that humor has, has become this now that everyone's feel like they got to point out how it offends them and you can't make any jokes. But the real point is for a person to go, you know, this person we typically think of as a dredge, uh, a net negative on society. They're out here working hard. What is my excuse? What can I do? And and you want to you want to use words to achieve something, which is, you know, ideally something positive, something constructive, like motivation. And this that's what the quote does. <laughs> you know? And I want let me, let me park on something you just said there, man. You're a hundred percent right, and I never thought of it until we've just unpacked this. We think of people that have addictions. And we say they're they're just lazy, they're no good, they're this, they're that. You just hit on something profound. They they're constantly working their mind. They're constantly trying to figure out how do I get the next high? How do I get so to your point, man, that is brilliant because their mind is probably and they're probably working harder than you and I are working to get that fixed because they don't know how they're going to come up with it. They just know they got to get it. And, and I, and I love what you said there about, about that, that work. Was there something else that when you think back to that time in your, in your youth, and we'll get to your story here in a few minutes, but was there something else that you found from watching this guy besides the fact of, man, this guy is working hard. He's just he's working hard in a different way. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I mean, was I did I ask the question correctly? I, I hope I, I, I know what you're asking. I'm, I'm, I think what you're asking is, you know, what, what other lessons did I take from this character? Right. And <laughs> I mean, the, the, the lesson is this. One of the things I tell people is uh, is you have to you have to get control of of your dark side. You don't want to get rid of it. You want to get control of it because that's what's going to give you an edge. That's the thing that's going to make you a little, a little better, a little more competitive. It's like, like, it's like people who, who get sober, who get clean and they take that energy, that obsession and they apply it to something else. And they just, they turn into monsters. I got a guy who trains people said his best clients were, were former addicts just the way they work and how focused they are they are and then that's what it is i mean a lot of it dude i i, I dealt with the with alcohol abuse and i quit i've been sober for eight years and i'll tell you what man my life all that energy was was going there it's here now and it is it's great it's a great outcome so that's another thing another thing that i took from that is is a kind of a reiteration a reaffirmation of the idea that you need to take your dark side and you really have to control it. You have to mold it. You have to use it. Otherwise, it's going to use you and destroy you. We don't want to get rid of the demons. We don't want to purge them. We want to put a leash on them. and We want to put restraints and we want to use that energy and control it. It's like any source of power. You know, a fire can burn your house down or you can eat it. It's up to you. No, I love what you said there about those sources of power, because again, I think what happens in life, Ed, is, is experiences, experience either does one or two things to us. It either causes us to, to have so much fear, we never want to go back there. And so we're paralyzed about always thinking, man, I, I'm one step away from going back to where I was. Or it does the opposite effect of, you know what, man? I am focused every day on staying focused and moving ahead 
so that that version of myself never comes back again. And, and I think you, you, you just said it beautifully. It's getting control of that dark side and going, listen, man, you're never coming back here again. I don't care what I got to do to put you out for good, but it's never happening again. I, I want to go here with you with your boxing career. And in, in, in boxing, for those that, that aren't real familiar, it's controlled aggression. I oh, mean, that's, the why they call, that's why they call it the beautiful sport, is, and soccer is that way too. But boxing, every part of your body has to be synchronized together. If your footwork is off, your hand placement is going to be off where you jab or punch, or if you're trying to get a right cross or a right hook and you're not set in that stance that you want to be at to deliver a powerful blow, you, you're going to be off. Or if, you're, if you let your opponent dictate the fight to bring the fight to you, instead of you controlling the, out, the, the tempo from the opening bell, it's going to be a bad day. When you talk about controlling the dark side, think back to your boxing career. How did you control the dark side when you were inside the ring? You... Well, the, the first of all, there's rules, which is great. There's rules and penalties for breaking said rules. Okay. So what you have to do is you have to, you have to learn to not just work on emotion. You don't want to get rid of emotion you, because, you know, that's no good at all because you won't have a thing to kind of drop you and push you through a lot of painful situations. But when you when you do have it, and this was an issue I actually had in my career, I used to try and not have my emotions involved. Instead, I had to eventually learn to use them to to energize, motivate, push me through hard days, push me through hard moments. Because willpower is great, but you need a certain kind of um, you need a certain kind of fire against the guy you're fighting because he's coming with it, and if he's coming with it and you don't have it, and you just have this kind of, uh, like an android, like a cyborg, like approach to things, sure, I mean, it, it, it can it can work, but but from a marketing, you know, from a business standpoint, it's not as interesting, from a fighting standpoint, since humans aren't like that, it's certainly better to just learn to control it. Uh, you know, when you're angry, like when you get hit in the nose, the, the, the uninitiated response is to, to flare up and get angry. The fighter goes, okay, this this hurts. Let me fight through it. But I think at the top of it goes, oh, you got one on me. I'm going to get one back on you when you're in control when you do it. And I got to ask you this. is Do you have to force yourself to be pugilistic when you're in the ring? Because I, I, you could be, <laughs> you could be, you could be, you, you know, a lot of times you think about, and I'll use this term, square enough. Okay, yeah. you think about when you're a kid, you get picked on, you get bullied. You know, in my case, I got bullied. And you think, okay, I'm, I'm going to square up because, I, man, I'm ready to fight. This is – I'm going to teach this guy, listen, he's not going to pick on me anymore. He's not going to mess with me anymore. And I think about guys, if, if I was doing it for a living like you did, there are guys that you probably genuinely like maybe guys that were really good friends and now you're set, you're you're squaring off against them in the ring and it's competition and it's like man I've got to hit this guy I really like this dude I got but I got to hit him I got to knock him out for me to get paid for me to move up in my career how do you control that emotion of fight of of kind of forcing a pugilistic attitude uh so what you want to do is you want to understand how your brain is going to work and then try and not make your brain work against its nature. So when you, when you identify someone as, as like you, like human, I'm reading this great book on this right now called On Killing. And one of the things they talk about is that it's a lot harder to kill when you, 
when you see the opponent, when you see your enemy, your target as a human, when you see them like you and they do things that like humanize themselves, like it's harder to kill kill a soldier if he's in the middle of taking a piss, for example, because that mm-hmm. is, is like you. Okay, so, so we know that, that that's just how we're built. So one of the worst things you can do, and I learned this too, is you don't you don't want to talk to the guy, you don't want to see the guy as your friend until I mean you can do it after you fight, but beforehand you know it, it becomes a lot more difficult for a lot of people. I mean unless you like a, like a psycho, and then there's certainly uh, I think people with a greater tendency for psychopathic traits to fight because of what fighting demands of you, and it. You know, you, it, you it, it's easy for for a person who's never fought to be like, yeah, it must be hard to to hit your boy. And then on the other end, I'm like, well, that's my boy. I'm gonna I'm light him up, right? And that's that's interesting. It's two different thought yeah. processes. Um, but it but it, it's real because because I think I think we have to understand as fighters, no matter how much you like somebody, I fight guys with families and I was aware of the uh, implication of him losing and getting hurt, but it's like, well, that's cool, but he's not thinking about that for me and I know that if he is, he's going to lose, that's weakness, and if I think about it, it's going to be weakness for me. So it's an interesting balance, but I think ultimately the pros outweigh the cons, and we we, we train, sport why you train, we train to not think about that kind of thing, where we th- we train yeah. to win, and really, the quicker you win, the less damage you have to inflict. The, like the the damage doesn't come blowing a guy out if you can do that. The damage comes when you have you know eight, ten rounds of a punishment because because it's a high level fight and he's a tough dude, and then you're just like, okay, while well, you're still here, there's a great like there's a great fight if you want to like see see like some mercy kind of happening, and it happens occasionally like the old George Foreman when he was coming back, he didn't uh, try and brutalize his opponents, but Manny Pacquiao fights this guy Margarito, uh, um, uh, uh, Antonio Margarito. And, and, and Manny Pacquiao was putting a beat on him. And he's just like, come on, ref, just stop the fight. He's got a gas. The guy ended up needing, like, plastic surgery to repair a gash on his face. And Pacquiao was just like, I'm not really going to kill this guy. He's, he's, he's beat down. But that's after he, he beat him down. If he, if he pulls yeah. the brakes back any time before then, perhaps he doesn't win the fight the way he Well, did. yeah, it's like a defensive lineman having a free – having a, a shot at a quarterback and, and pulling up going, well, I – I don't want to. I don't want to hit this guy because if I, you know, I'm going to blow. No, man. The defensive, the defensive player is going to do what the defensive player is supposed to do. He's going to blow up the quarterback because if your right. tackle or your back didn't block, didn't do what they were supposed to do, you have put your quarterback in peril. And a defensive guy is going to do what a defensive guy gets paid to do. He's going to blow that guy up. You reminded me, you know, when the um, – I think, man, I can't remember the year, but you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, the year the Patriots went. I think it was 07 or 08 when they went undefeated. And, and they yeah. didn't just go undefeated, man. They were, like, blowing guys out. And to the point where they were like, you know, why aren't they pulling Tom Brady? And it's an interesting argument because it's like, on the one hand, okay, you know, you guys are winning. Brady's your your big investment. Why are we keeping him in? On the other hand, it's like Brady understands that these guys are going to be in there trying to take him out, and the team is trying to hold its competitive edge throughout the season. So let's just keep everybody, keep all the starters in and keep playing because we're coming to win and we're coming to, to rip throats out, okay? And my so, guy Randy Moss, who went <laughs> to Marshall University where I went to school, was just was beating guys deep, and all Tom Brady had to do was just throw it up there, and Randy would go get it. What a what a freaking <laughs> injury! I watched the thirty for thirty on Randy Moss, Rand University, and and what, what people don't here's what we, Randy. When you, I used to be a whole guy, I used to think you know talent was this thing that that didn't really exist, and you could you know give it enough time, work your way up to it. Randy Moss is one of those guys that changed my opinion because I don't care how hard you were. You're like, you will never, you will never be as fast. You will never be as tall. And his sense of the game, you will never have that. They they talk about when he was up there in New England. I guess a lot of a lot of receivers were back when, when Brady was up there, they would try to go to New England and resurrect their, their career. You saw that, but uh, uh, I can't even remember the guy's name, uh, but a few guys have gone. Yeah. 
most of women fail because the system is is relative. I guess more complicated than than we would ever know. And Tom said, you know, Randy's the smartest receiver he's ever worked with. A lot of guys come here and they can't they can't get it. They, they can't figure yeah. it out. Yeah, uh, and, and 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 you know, his coach at at Marshall, Bob Pruitt, said this before the draft. He said, when God built a wide receiver, you think about all the traits. You want a wide receiver to have great hands. He said, Randy Moss has world-class hands. You want a guy that's tall. Randy Moss is 6'4", 6'4 half. You want a guy that can run. Randy Moss runs a sub 4'3". He said, you got the perfect wide receiver. And, and what he did was, yes, his talent – was so superior to your point, Ed. I love that point you made. But he had a guy like Chris Carter who was a hard yeah. worker. And 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 Carter talks to this day about saying, look, man, if you're going to have the longevity I've got and you're going to catch everything like I catch it, here's what you got to do. you got to work hard. Always be working on your craft. And that's why you see the longevity of greatness with Randy Moss because he had a guy like Chris Carter who had a longevity of greatness. I mean, Carter was catching balls into his late 30s. And so I love that, man. Let's step aside, take a b- quick break. We come back, I want to get into your story. Uh, yeah. you, you teased it a minute ago about overcoming addiction. I want to get into that. My guest, Ed Lattimore, author. Um, you can go to edlattimore.com and find out more about his resources. But more with Ed Lattimore here on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Back in a moment. Hey everybody, Brian Sexton. Want to tell you about my new book, People Buy From People. 10 powerful people lessons from the ultimate people person, my dad. My dad was one of the greatest connectors that I ever knew. And he shared with me 10 connecting principles that I have used throughout my 25 year sales and sales management, customer engagement and leadership career that I'm passing along to you. If you want to be a stronger deeper and more powerful connector you've got to pick up a copy of people buy from people there are concepts in there that you may not realize help make you a power connector you can go to amazon and pick it up kindle if you're an e-reader and you like to do it that way or now available on audible and there's one other way you can get a copy of people buy from people you can get one from me and i'll sign it for you you go to intentional media and publishing at gmail.com and send me an email And I'll share with you the link on how you can get a signed copy. You can buy a signed copy directly from me. Again, people buy from people. If you want to connect like never before, pick up your copy today of people buy from people. And now let's get back to more great conversation here on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Ed, let's get into your story. I want you to take me as far back as you want to take me from point A to today. Oh, man. Just take us through your journey. That's a that's a crazy, uh, that's a lot of stuff. Because it, it, there's transitions and things that go up and down. I mean, you know, I was, was born raised, born and raised here in Pittsburgh. And I was born in a, in a public housing project. And, you know, I, I lived with just my mom. I, like, I knew my dad, but he, was, he wasn't really around. And... That, that that teaches you a lot, force you to deal with a lot of things you think are normal until you get around other people and you're like, oh, that's not normal at all. And I went through that when I got to high school because I went to a high school across town and there I, I was like, oh, this is crazy what I've gone through and learned. And then I'm like, all right, this is the life I want to aim towards and then try and develop and build myself up to it. So I get out and I, you know, I, I do the whole, you know, from, from 14 to like, 22 or like there's it's an interesting age up and down but not really anything i think notable in terms of the whole storyline of ed Lattimore, except that you know at 22 then I, I started boxing and i went in and a lot of guys at that age a lot of guys period try this and i don't understand it but but i rather like they explain their reasoning but but if they're serious i don't understand it they decide they're going to come in and go pro immediately and that is a bad idea. Like, what a bad idea! Because you just once you, you can't undo your pro losses, 
and you need to build up yourself in the amateurs and and try to be and try to be um you know, maybe try and get one a national title or something, but learn the craft as an amateur where, you know, you're expected to lose. You just don't make any money. You actually spend a, you spend a lot of money, actually, as, a, as an amateur. Not not as much as if I was, like, playing polo or something, but it's a, it's a lot of a lot of money and investment. So so I was an amateur for, from the age of 22, I turned pro. I turned pro um, a few weeks. January 26th was my first professional fight 2013 so that was a few weeks before my 28th birthday and so i spent oh okay this is great with these dates because you can just like do the math so i spent i spent uh the, the 22 to 28 six years an amateur and then as a pro five years after that and i had a really good career as an amateur i, I won a national title i had a ranking and i got paid a stipend at some point I was, it was a pretty good pretty good time and it took me to a lot of introduced me to a lot of friends taught me the value of what i could do during this whole time and i was i was drinking quite a lot and i'm sure that hammered my development and but but it also uh it also kept me i think from making moves in a lot of areas and that became really clear right before i went pro right when i was going pro i didn't have any employment prospects, I didn't, uh, any way to make money at all. I was working at T-Mobile as a, uh, it was as a customer service rep, whatever, you know, not, not a bad gig, but certainly not one you're going to make a lot of money on and you're going to have to spend a lot of time. I was training to fight and I said, dude, this sucks. Uh, I need more options. And so I, in the middle of my professional career, when I had just started, I had also just met the, the woman who's in the other room now. She's known me a year. I said, I'm going to enlist in the military. So I enlisted in the National Guard and went off. And I said, now I'm going to get some skills and go to school. That was the main reason to get money to go to school. Uh, come out. And when I when I get back from my training and everything's about to start, I also decide that I got to stop drinking because that's clearly been a problem. So I stopped that. And that's why I consider it December 23rd, uh, 2013. That's like my second birthday. That's like, there's like my life before then and my life after. Because ever since then, it's been really a, a constantly upward push. It's been, you know, I've improved in, in, in my, my writing and my website is huge. I had my professional career. I got my degree, graduated with my degree in physics when I was 33. I've got a great relationship. Oh. Uh, Coming up now on uh, it be nine nine years since I met her this year, or nine years since we've been together. Uh, eight years since I met her. It's been a good. It's been a good life, <laughs> and 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 I'm really well. And, and I know how bad it it could have turned out, you know, because I see what happens. I know how stressful because because for me, freedom's everything, right? Like 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 if, if I made if I, if I never make more than a hundred thousand dollars again. But I don't have to worry about where my food is coming from. Uh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be happy, right? You know, my bills and all that'll be good. Unfortunately, you know, I don't think that it's gonna happen like that. Because what tends to happen is, if you fall in love with your craft, mm -hmm. you prove, and then the results improve. And my craft is writing. And I really just want to continue to be the best content producer and best writer that I can be, and affect as many people as I can with my words. So that's that's kind of the 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 that's the most abridged version I think I've given of my life in a long time, man. To cover everything, I mean, I left out you know some, you know key or, or not key moments. I covered the key ones, but but things that people go, oh, that'd be interesting, you know, stop off and talk. You know, but that 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 there it is. Well, and and the thing about it is that I love is that you said my judgment, things got better, you know, because you talked about the alcohol impairing your judgment and, and not, you know, not having good judgment, but just saying, okay, I, I need to do better. Looking back, what do you feel like got, what else got better in your life when the, the, when the drinking stopped? Oh man! Uh, well, for for starters, I people no longer had a way to steal my time through incentives. So, 
And now I didn't really realize this when I stopped drinking. It was just one of those things that happened. And as time went on, I was like, wow, I'm not spending time with some people. I'm spending, I'm meeting other people who are more interesting and more, more aligned with my purpose in life. And that happened because I stopped wasting time with people who weren't people who it was only let's get together, have a drink or they knew if it wasn't for the alcohol, I wouldn't come around. So I got my time back, and with my time back, I got to be more productive. My, I had a, a, a focus now because you know when you when you when you improve via negative or when you take things away, what tends to happen is you something else has to take that place. This is why you got to be careful when you try and break a bad habit because you need to replace it with something good. Otherwise, you're just going to have this hole that's going to get filled by by the lowest energy demand possible, which tends to be a bad habit. But I get rid of the bad habit, and I was really fortunate in the timing of when I stopped drinking because I was in the military, I had school, I was I had pro fighting, I had an internship, I had my girlfriend. I mean, I was busy, and I never had time to to fall into bad habits. And instead, I got to keep building up a bunch of other ones that I'm really happy uh, with. But I would never have been able to like, like I couldn't imagine. I don't I don't know how I did it without drinking. Right when I when I look back at all the things I was doing, especially in the year 2015, 2016, that was those, those were hell years. They were very difficult. I don't know how I would have did that if I was drinking. But since I wasn't, I had a, I had a fighting chance, and I got through through it all. Uh, you know, I never I, I always always talk about this or think about this. My my girlfriend never has to worry about. Oh, my my behavior while I'm intoxicated, doing it, you know, that, that puts the relationship at risk. It never never occurs. Like we were at a wedding once, and one of the guests got got really drunk, and caused some problems, and I was like, you know, think be, then you should be grateful. You never have to worry about that. Like like you ain't never gonna have to be wondering, you know, oh, what's he gonna say or do? He's drinking. No, you don't never happen, right? No. And, uh, so, so, it, and, and in that, you get this new final sense of, of, of respect. And respect is cool because respect you have to earn. Uh, and I, like, I don't care if people like me or not. Like, that, that's certainly nice and cool. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan of people respecting me. And when you respect, respect a person, it's a, uh, it goes a long way. You, you want to make, you want to live in such a way that even your enemies, uh, have nothing bad to say about you other than they just like you. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. Ed, I, I want to get to your biggest piece of intentional encouragement because you have taken us, man, you've taken us through a lot in your life. And I, I appreciate, thank you for being so transparent with your, you know, what life was like for you because a lot of people, would, would listen to this conversation and they would go, man, you're a pro fighter, you're a pro athlete. But you knew you had something that was holding you back with your alcoholism. You talk about your second birthday, man. I loved it. I was just, I was just hanging on every word. Like, this is so good, what you're talking about. Maybe somebody is struggling with maybe being addicted to working too much. You can be addicted to working too much. Oh, yeah. You can be addicted to a lot of things, food or something like that. Leave folks with your biggest piece of intentional encouragement, the, the thing that motivates you and keeps you going. Uh, you know, it's one single thing, the single biggest thing at Keystone, I, I enjoy being able to respect myself, man. Uh, that's really, that's really important. Now I have a high, st you, you got to have a standard. You got to have something that makes you go, okay, this is, this is uh, worthy of what I would do. This is when you have that and then you don't want to let yourself down. You want to keep reaching that. Then you're in a good position, you know, then you're able to go. All right. This is what I want to do. Um, this is this this is what I don't want to do. This is how I want to live, and everything falls into place with your value system. And so that I think is the most important thing to have is a value system. If you 
go from that value system, everything is gonna fall into place, and you're gonna you'll you'll be happy. At the very least, you you won't you you, you won't live with uh, any type of surface level or deeply rooted shame. Man, I love that. The most important thing in life to have is a value system, a good value system. Ed Lattimore, man, this has been great conversation today. Tell folks how they can get connected with you, get connected with your resources, reach out to you. I know you're on Twitter. Um, you have a website. Just tell folks how they can get connected with you. Uh, I'm Ed Lattimore everywhere. I'm Ed Lattimore on Twitter. I'm Ed Lattimore on Instagram. I'm Ed Lattimore on Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, my website is edlattimore.com. It is all just E-D-L-A-T-I-M-O-R-E. Twitter, LinkedIn. Facebook, Instagram, and then you can go to his website, edlattimore.com, L-A-T-I-M-O-R-E, edlattimore.com. Ed, man, what a powerful conversation we've had today, and uh, uh, man, I can't thank you enough for doing this and joining me today on the Attentional Encourager podcast. Oh, no problem, man. I I'm really happy that you had me. My thanks as always to producer Bryce Sexton and technical advisor Matt Means. And of course, the ultimate thanks goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who provides intentional encouragement every day through his word. If you're not subscribed to the Intentional Encourager podcast, hit the subscribe button wherever you get podcasts so you don't miss an exciting episode where you can get encouraged and stay encouraged. And remember, anyone, anywhere, at any time, any place can be an intentional encourager.